This is episode 19 of the Billions of Atoms podcast. Have you ever pondered the threads connecting us to each other and the stars? The Billions of Atoms podcast explores these questions and more, where science meets spirituality, personal stories reveal universal truths, and meaning becomes a shared journey. The Billions of Atoms podcast, where we delve into human connections one story at a time. It's an auditory journey, reclaiming humanity through the atomic bonds uniting us, exploring meaning, purpose, and personal growth. Join us on a reflective journey through modern landscapes, personal challenges, and the eternal quest for understanding, approaching science, spirituality, and personal identity with curiosity. We invite you to an intimate yet expansive dialogue. We see ourselves as fellow travelers, not authorities exchanging stories by the campfire of our shared humanity. In this series, we embrace the boundless quest for understanding, celebrate diverse thought, and revel in the beauty of uncertainty. Each episode aims to connect us, showing that profound truths often lie within our individual experiences. Join us on the Billions of Atoms podcast as we explore human thought, experience, and emotion, unraveling the mysteries of existence, one reflection at a time. Rediscover your place in the cosmos. Like you, my life reflects a diverse array of human experiences. Like your experiences, they are uniquely mine. Love gained and lost, the passing of cherished loved ones, thrilling adventures, moments of both trauma and happiness. Due to circumstance, my life unfolded in a series of pivotal moments. Before my mother's liberation from my father, before I departed home, before my brother's passing, before meeting a significant lover. These moments are always followed by transformative afters, deeply fulfilling for me on a personal level. Befores and afters shape our lives. They are our point of reference. Afters and the lessons we take from them have the power to propel us forward. So in today's episode, I want to share a deeply personal before and after story from my youth. Picture this, a young woman virtually radiating with youth's untamed energy. He was truly beautiful, her long hair cascading down to small of her back, her olive skin a testament to her vibrant spirit, and her smile, it could and would light up the darkest corners of any room. She was on top of the world, enjoying life to its fullest, her future was bright and the possibilities were endless. We mark a significant chapter in her life, her first time living away from home. She stepped into this new phase with a mix of excitement and apprehension, a bundle of dreams in her eyes. And there I was, having made a solemn promise to my aunt that I would watch over her to shield her from life's harshest storms while also letting her bask in its sunniest days. I was her older cousin, and I took that responsibility 
very seriously. Jenny was my cousin. The daughter of my mother's sister, she had asked me if I could find a flat together so we could move in. We were 19 years old and she wanted to explore the world beyond the confines of her parents' home. If I had foreseen the tragic outcome of this decision, I would never have agreed to such a proposal. Welcome fellow travellers to another personal tale from the intricate fabric of my own life. It's another episode where we unravel the threads of my own human experience in the hope we can inspire anyone suffering their own personal tragedies. We embark on this journey through the corridors of self-discovery. We shed light on the corners of our psyche often left unexplored. Today's odyssey takes us through a landscape shaped by personal loss and grief. Yet, it is underpinned by the development of resilience that defines us. This is not just a recounting of events, but a contemplation on the meaning we carve from the stone of our collective hardships. By 19, I had already been living independently on my own and with my twin brother since the age of 15. I had moved towns a few times already and had finished a trade as a painter. I moved back to the town where I'd went to school in an effort to re-establish the bonds with old school friends and started my own business as a contractor. For those of you who have listened to previous episodes, you would understand a fragment of the significance of this achievement. I emerged from my teens after moving out of home at 15 living independently, working hard to build a future, desperately wanting to overcome the dysfunction and violence I had witnessed as a child. Yes, I was confused. Yes, I was dysfunctional. But I, was, I had objectives, I had goals, and I had a vision. Upon moving back to the small country town where I would went to school, I needed to find a flat. Through a series of discussions and teenage enthusiasm, my cousin and I started talking about getting a place together. Jenny was a vibrant, smiling beauty. She was known in the town for being the most beautiful girl in town. She had this look that radiated all Australian girl. Her hair was her most distinct feature and it was the one she was most proud of. Long and straight, and even in a plait would extend down to the small of her back. We found a quaint apartment that held the promise of freedom and the thrilling beginnings of adult life. We moved in together and our excitement was palpable. Jenny was like a ray of sunshine on the darkest of days. Her energy was contagious. Her spirit was indomitable. She had an infectious laugh that could bring even the grumpiest of people out of their shells. Our first few months of living together were a whirlwind of adventures, laughter and navigating the responsibilities of adulthood. She had a boyfriend who tagged along like a devoted puppy, utterly smitten with her. Meanwhile, Jenny was deeply in love with a different boy, a typical heartthrob type who kept her hanging on and she seemed content to be kept waiting. Jenny had a vast and varied circle of friends and acquaintances. I had moved away from town many years ago, and many of my old school friends had changed so dramatically that we had very little in common anymore. Specifically, Many of my old friends had taken up drug habits and this surprised and confused me as they had all seemed to have amazing childhoods free from the poverty and trauma and violence that I had experienced. Drugs were off limits for me personally. I had spent my childhood around people with mental illnesses and had read enough by that stage to know that drug use with a genetic predisposition was a dangerous game for me to play. 
While I had used alcohol as a way of self-medicating and overcoming problems, but given the damage I had seen it caused those around me as a child, I was very conscious of limiting my exposure to alcohol to once or twice a week and never would I allow it to affect my work. Due to the growing distance between my old schoolmates and me, our friend circle was mainly comprised of Jenny's friends. My girlfriend and I were caught up in a typical teenage romance cycle of breakups and reconciliations. I found myself torn between moving on and reigniting our relationship, and this occupied most of my free time between work. One evening as the sun painted the sky with hues of orange and pink, we found ourselves on our patio, talking and just hanging out. Suddenly, a group of neighbours from a few flats down, who were more acquaintances of Jenny's rather than close friends, decided to join our intimate gathering, adding a touch of spontaneity to our evening. We spent the evening playing card games and sipping a small amount of alcohol and sharing laughs. As the night progressed, one of our friends proposed a spontaneous trip to his parents' farm. Weekends often meant escaping to the bush for us as kids. It was a time when kids could revel in the freedom to be as loud as they pleased, gather around a campfire and gaze at the twinkling stars above. Despite my reservations about the group, I did hesitantly voice my concerns, but eventually we found ourselves packed into two vehicles, embarking on the 15 kilometre journey to the property. We drove down the winding path to the old farmhouse, the darkness of the night enveloping us. It was past midnight when we arrived, but a warm light beckoned from within. One of the boys hurried inside to let his parents know of our presence. Upon his return, he emerged carrying two rifles, sharing that his parents had approved his plan to go shooting rabbits on the property. We drove around in the bush, the headlights of the vehicles cutting through the darkness, casting beams of light onto the dusty trails. As music played, our laughter echoed through the night, creating an atmosphere of carefree joy and camaraderie. It was a time of simple pleasures and unforgettable moments, a snapshot of our youth filled with spontaneity and happiness. At some point, the vehicles came to a halt and the son of the owners of the property decided with another boy it was time to test their marksmanship skills with the rifles. They carefully selected a target among the trees around 30 metres away, taking turns they aimed at the target and honed in their sights. It was a ritual that felt all too familiar for me. Back when I was 17, I had purchased a rifle from a second-hand shop I would strap the rifle onto my motorbike and venture out to an old quarry in Mount Isa where I would spend my time shooting at bottles and cans just for fun. Interestingly, I never found joy in hunting animals despite its common practice in Australia for vermin control of non-native species. While many engaged in shooting animals for entertainment, it was a pastime I could never quite embrace. While the two boys were meticulously fine-tuning their shots and adjusting the sights on the rifle, I found myself casually positioned in front of one of the vehicles, engaged in a conversation with Jenny. As we stood there, the headlights of the car illuminated our surroundings, casting a warm glow as we chatted, each of us standing on opposite sides of the car. At that moment, Tom, whose parents owned the property, was in the midst of sighting in the rifle. As he turned around, a sudden chill ran down my spine as I noticed the gun pointing at Jenny. The air seemed to freeze as Tom uttered, bang, you're dead. Jenny, with a mix of concern and nonchalance, responded, it's not loaded. The gravity of the situation hit me like a ton of bricks. I had always upheld a deep and unwavering reverence for firearms and their safe handling. 
the cardinal rule echoed in my mind. Never point a gun at anyone under any circumstances. In that tense moment, a surge of emotions flooded through me. I felt a surge of anger as I contemplated grabbing the gun, pushing it away and giving Tom a piece of my mind. However, before I could act on my impulses, a deafening sound pierced the air. The next second felt like an eternity as Jenny crumpled before my eyes. The weight of the situation sinking in with each passing moment. It felt like before she had even hit the ground, time slowed down, as if the world went into a dreamlike state. In that suspended moment, I caught her in my arms, a surge of adrenaline propelling me to act instinctively. Rushing to the passenger side of the vehicle, I yelled through the chaos as I urgently called for someone to open the back door. With care, I gently placed her in the back seat, the weight of the situation sinking in with each movement. This moment unfolded like a sequence from a movie. The sudden sound of the gun, her collapsing form, and then me reaching out to sweep her up into my arms. The scene played out in slow motion each detail etched vividly in my mind as I carefully settled her into the back seat. Amidst the commotion, I barked out orders, directing others to take action. Go to the homestead, call the ambulance. The urgency of the situation palpable in my voice. Tell them we're on our way to the hospital and we'll meet them on the road. As the gravity of the situation dawned on the group, a sense of panic and confusion gripped the air. Once more I yelled above the din, get in the car, go to the house and call for the ambulance. I got in the driver's seat and started driving along the dusty road into town. Jenny's boyfriend in the back and Tom's girlfriend in the front. 
I remembered vividly the overwhelming surge of anger that seemed to have taken root within me, a deep-seated emotion brewing within me since childhood. The memories of violence and pain inflicted upon my mother and family flashed before my eyes, fueling a desire to unleash all of that pent-up rage upon Tom. The urge to make him pay for his sheer stupidity and reckless actions consumed my thoughts. But this was for a split second. I was moving instinctively without thought and before I even registered, I was driving to the hospital with Jenny in the back seat. As we drove, tears streamed down my face, my heart racing with fear. I desperately called out to Jenny, urging her to hang on, imploring her boyfriend to locate the source of her injury. Jenny lay unconscious, yet clinging to life, attempting to utter words amid soft groans. With trembling hands on the wheel, I called out her name repeatedly, the weight of the situation heavy on my shoulders. In the midst of the chaos, I turned to Jenny's boyfriend, my voice quivering, and I asked if he could spot the wound. He located it a small entry point just below her left breast. Despite the absence of blood, the gravity of the situation was palpable. I instructed him to gently apply pressure to the wound, all the while trying to comfort Jenny. I yelled declarations of love, reminding her of the dreams and adventures we still had to share. Hold on, Jenny, I pleaded. My voice was breaking. You'll be okay. I love you, Jenny. Just hold on. We arrived at the hospital and Tom's girlfriend rushed into the lobby to get help. It was around 2 a.m. So the hospital exuded an eerie peace until it was abruptly disrupted by a sudden rush of commotion, cries and shouts echoing through the corridors. Swiftly responding to the urgency, the nurses brought a stretcher and gently transported Jenny into the emergency room. However, as it was a small country hospital, there was no doctor present on duty at that late hour intensifying the sense of urgency and concern among those present. I stood outside the hospital with an overwhelming sense of emotions. Memories flooded back as I realised I was standing in the exact same position I had stood in as a child, halfway down that hill, on the driveway leading to the awning between the two buildings. It was here that I witnessed my father's car painted red with blood after he was shot. Despite the years that had passed, the scene appeared almost frozen in time, with the only difference being the make and model of the car. The early morning mist hung in the air. The fluorescent lights overhead created the same halo effect, adding an eerie glow to the surroundings. I could hear Jenny moaning and garbling, trying to speak. The nurses came out and told us Jenny was asking after Carl, her unrequited love. I found his number and called him and told him to come to the hospital. At some stage, Tom and the others finally arrived. My heart raced as I caught sight of him, a surge of boiling anger rising within me. He had failed to call an ambulance, leaving us in a state of chaos. Tom's expression was a mix of confusion and detachment, and that only fueled my frustration further. As he advanced towards me, his face displaying a bewildered look, I couldn't contain the overwhelming surge of emotions. With each punch I threw a mix of anger and helplessness. Tom retreated, seeking refuge in the corner of the hospital driveway. The sound of shattering glass echoed as my rage consumed me, painting the scene with a sense of raw intensity. One of the hospital wardsmen in a crisp white coat spoke to me in a gentle tone. He reminded me that now is not the time for anger, emphasising that it is only exacerbating Jenny's already challenging situation. He asked me to gather some of the other boys and together 
we went and helped him clear the rear car park at the back of the hospital for a helicopter that was flying in from the larger hospital that was 120 kilometres away. Later, Jenny's mother arrived. I caught a glimpse of her approaching before she even stepped inside. Hastily, I made my way over, feeling a knot of anxiety tightening in my chest. I managed to stammer out an apology for being unable to prevent the accident that had befallen Jenny. Her mother's response was unexpectedly gentle. She reassured me with a soft smile and quietly entered the hospital to stand vigil by Jenny's side in the theatre. In the aftermath of that emotional exchange, the weight of grief and guilt pressed down on me like a lead shroud. Overwhelmed by the intensity of that moment, I retreated to the shadows at the edge of the hospital grounds. There, the th sounds of the bustling hospital faded into the background, leaving me alone with my thoughts. Suddenly, a piercing wail shattered the stillness. The heart-rending cry of my auntie, a sound so raw and primal that it seemed to reverberate through the entire town. A clarion call, carrying the weight of a mother's unimaginable loss. As the reality of the situation sank in, I found myself rooted to the spot, grappling with a sense of helplessness and despair. The anguished screams seemed to echo in my ears, a stark reminder of the fragility of life and the cruelty of fate. In a moment of overwhelming emotion, I made a split-second decision. I had to escape, to flee from the unbearable sorrow that threatened to engulf me. Without a second thought, I sprang to my feet and ran. Each footfall carried me further away from the heart-wrenching sounds that heralded the tragic news of Jenny's passing.
I left the hospital grounds just as the sun gently rose, the soft lighting casting a sombre glow on the empty streets. I walked the familiar paths back home. I finally reached my vehicle and the drive to the shooting site was filled with a mix of emotions. My mind was trying to process the gravity of the situation. Sitting out there for what felt like hours, the weight of the recent events sank deeper. Once again, I found myself at the edge of a life-altering moment, straddling the boundary between before and after. It was a chasm created by the cruel hands of fate and another unexpected event. The raw pain of loss enveloped me, each heartbeat echoing the memory of the gunshot that shattered the peace of that day. The loss was personal, hitting close to home, a young cousin's vibrant light extinguished prematurely. It was a tragic twist in the narrative of a simple outing turned awry, where the fragility of life confronted a group of unsuspecting teens. A single act of negligence and stupidity, ending a beautiful life full of so much promise. Our family, peeling back the layers of sorrow, we uncovered the raw emotional backdrop of grief's unexpected intrusion into our lives. Our family found itself engulfed in a whirlwind of mourning, clinging tightly to one another for support, seeking solace amid the overwhelming confusion of unanswerable questions. Each aspect of our existence transformed into a narrative of before Jenny and after Jenny. The poignant farewell at Jenny's funeral drew the entire town together. 7,000 people turned out in a procession of honour guards lining the streets. Paying their respects as we made our way past in the funeral procession. The heartfelt tribute continued as we passed through the town, past the nursing home where Jenny had devoted her time. Her popularity evident in the sea of mourners who gathered to bid her farewell. Her untimely departure left a profound impact, a life extinguished far too soon, etching her memory deeply into the hearts of all who knew her. For me, after Jenny's involvement, many years were spent isolating myself socially and from my family. I couldn't face my auntie and that moment at the hospital was one of the last moments I ever caught sight of her. It led to me becoming a workaholic and a heavy binge drinker, often alone and to the point of blackout. Myself and others who witnessed the events of that night endured testifying at trials in court that ultimately resulted in the failure of any form of conviction for Tom. This was due to three juries being unable to reach a unanimous decision on his reckless negligence, leaving a sense of unresolved justice in the air and in the family. In this mosaic of experiences, I found myself a seeker of meaning within the shards of loss. Is it not within the crucible of adversity that we discover an unyielding resolve? We learn that to transform suffering is to weave it into wisdom. An alchemy of the soul, each lesson becomes a torch each memory a guiding star.
And why, you may wonder, bear the raw contours of this personal pilgrimage to you, the listener? It is because in vulnerability lies strength. By tenderly cradling our stories against the vast night, we illuminate the dawn for others. For isn't that the pulse of our existence? To support, to guide, to connect. This is not meant to be a story about me. It is a narrative I felt compelled to share, this story, 30 years after the event, in honour of Jenny. Through the years of keeping this experience to myself and sharing only with my most intimate partners, I've come to realise that the most respectful way to commemorate Jenny is not through my silence, but through celebration. By celebrating Jenny's essence and the potential she held, we keep our bond alive. It is in the act of discussing and recounting her story that I maintain our connection. Thus, I share the insights gained from the rubble, like discovering solace through solidarity in struggle and the balm of shared narratives. These revelations are offered as whispers of encouragement for weary souls navigating their tempests. Urging to seek assistance, kindred spirits, as you traverse your personal abysses, be they through therapists, through your confidants, or your own personal inner wells of fortitude. Our journey through life is not linear. It is full of twists and turns, ups and downs. Inevitably, there will be moments where we face unexpected challenges and losses that can leave us feeling lost and vulnerable. These are the shadows in our lives, experiences that cast the darkness over us, making it difficult to see the light and find our way forward. But within these shadows lay opportunities for growth and resilience. It is through navigating and overcoming these moments that we can emerge stronger and more resilient than ever before. Grief, in particular, is a shadow that we all must face at some point in our lives, whether it's from the passing of a loved one, the end of a relationship, or even the loss of a dream. Grief can be all-consuming and overwhelming. It can feel like we are drowning in a darkness, unable to see a way out. However, it is important to remember that grief is not something that we simply get over. Instead, it is a journey that we must take in order to heal and find our way back to the light. It is a process of learning to live with our loss while also finding ways to honour and remember what we have lost. One key aspect of overcoming shadows and grief is resilience. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from difficult experiences and come out stronger on the other side. It involves developing coping mechanisms, seeking out support and finding ways to thrive in the face of adversity. But resilience is not something we are born with. It is a skill that can be learned and developed. And it is through facing our shadows and navigating our grief that we can cultivate this important trait. In this journey, there may be times when we stumble or fall, we may feel stuck or unable to move forward, but it is important to remember that this is all part of the process. We must allow ourselves to mourn and grieve, but we must also find ways to continue moving forward towards healing and resilience. In conclusion, I emerge not scathed, but sculpted by my trials. We gaze with new eyes at a horizon imbued with possibility. Here lies the crux of our discourse. 
Can adversity be the womb of growth? The answer, though etched differently in each soul, resonates harmoniously within the chorus of humankind's underlying spirit. As I reflect on my own personal journey through grief to resilience, I am reminded that life is a constant ebb and flow of experiences, of befores and afters. We can never predict what will come next, but we can choose how we respond to these moments of change and challenge. Grief is a universal experience, but each person's journey is unique. It is not something that can be overcome or forgotten, but rather something that we can learn to live with. One of the most important lessons I've learned on my journey was the power of facing our shadows. Grief often brings up painful memories or unresolved issues from our past, and we may try to bury these feelings or push them away, but ultimately they will continue to haunt us until we confront them. Through facing my shadows and seeking help when needed, I found a way to honour Jenny's memory and find peace within myself. It was not an easy journey, but it was one that ultimately led towards healing and growth. As we navigate our own journeys through grief, may we never forget the ones we have lost and may we find solace in the memories and the lessons they left behind. Let us continue to hold one another close to celebrate the lives of those who have passed and to honour their legacies through our own resilience and strength. In the end, it's not just about surviving after loss, but finding meaning and purpose in the after. It is about honouring the ones we have lost by living our lives to the fullest with compassion, empathy and resilience. And as Sadhguru has said, there is no such thing as death. There is only life, life and more life. For as long as we remember and honour those we have lost, their light will continue to shine on through us. Let us carry that light with pride and use it to guide our way forward. I extend my gratitude for joining me on this shared passage through the shadowed valleys and luminous peaks of my existence. May the candour of my musings light your way and may the joint tenacity of our wanderings affirm the beauty that blooms from resilience. Until our paths cross again, travel on, seekers of the world's quiet questions and answers. And remember, you are billions of atoms, billions of years old. You are part of me and I am part of you and we are part of everyone and everything. This episode is obviously dedicated to Jenny. 
Jen, I want to say how sorry I am to you for not protecting you and to my auntie who is now once again cradling you against her breasts. I've carried this guilt my entire life. And I have tried my very best to live a life of honour and finding wonder and joy in every moment and the smallest of the world's gifts to honour and share those moments with you both.